think that should be working, so let's see, let's do this, this, and this, and I think, boom, there we go. All right, I think that may be working. Um, we're, we're still figuring all the technology out doing this live, so I think your mic was actually on earlier. I'm sorry about that. Oh, yeah. We, Rebecca, let us know. But I think we, we managed to fix that. So, um, we just put some popovers in the oven. And uh, we're going to take those out in a little bit, but um, but I thought I would uh, check in with you. Do you want to um, turn the burner on for the water? We'll heat up some water. Um, so maybe before, so you got some coffee things there to make some coffee with, but before we jump into that, um, I thought maybe I'd just ask some questions that uh, people might be interested in. So, so to, to get started, do you remember uh, the first time you had coffee? Oh boy. Uh, let's see, uh, yeah, that was uh, when I was a kid living in New Jersey, and I must have been around eight or nine years of age, and uh, my parents were making it in a vacuum pot. This was before the percolator. Okay. Thereabouts, and the smell was just wonderful, and uh, I thought the coffee itself was really bitter. Yeah, okay. So, and and so your, did your parents drink coffee? They did, they did, uh, you know, but I didn't really, then the only time I got into coffee when I was younger like that was when my father showed me with heavy cream, he put a spoon right at the surface of the black coffee and poured heavy cream on top and the cream would float, so you had a white cream surface on the coffee. Now that was really good for an eight-year-old. <laughs> Right. I've never had coffee like that. That sounds like something fun to try. Uh, yeah, it is. And then, you know, then later when I went to college and all of that, I was drinking lots of iced coffee with milk and sugar and all of that, you know, getting way too much caffeine. Then still later when I was living in the, uh, in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area back in the late 60s, I was going to a cafe there and I was getting Cafe Con Pana, which you don't see anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, espresso con pana, right? It's an espresso, instead of putting uh, the, the foam on top, you're putting whipped cream on it that's been whipped, right, on top. Okay. i got to tell you, it is delicious. Uh, I'm surprised uh -huh. it's never it's never offered anymore. It's something I've been considering for our cafes. Okay. So uh, it was not, it wasn't until uh, really, yeah, in around 67, 68, in yeah. the Berkeley area that I really yeah. turned on to black coffee. Um, I was just going, I was hearing there was a little echo in the audio, so we're still figuring all that out. I just was going to Whoops. try to turn that off. It might be a little better for everybody now. It, I don't think it's on your side. I think I fixed it. Okay. Um, sorry, we're, ha we're just like, each time we try this, we're learning a little little bit more about the technology. It's, uh, <laughs> I, I, I would say it's frustrating. It is frustrating, but we're going we're gonna, to yep. uh, make progress and we'll get better and better at it. Um, so you're the first person that we've called into. So thanks for being a pioneer. Uh, uh, all right. <laughs> and and George, I was I I was I've been as I've gotten to know you. Um, you're a real adventurer. Um, uh, you're you're always interested in learning new things, and you're um, you're you seem a little bit fearless and willing to try things. Have you always yeah. think of yourself that way? Have you always been that way? Um, yeah, and some things more than others. You know, but aesthetically, I've always been driven aesthetically, uh, from music uh, to uh, to art uh, to coffee. Not so much in food, going to restaurants and enjoying it, wine as also, but really I've just taken it to coffee. And uh, because I've lived as a kid in Mexico and so on, I'm I'm very used to travel and being in other countries. Mm -hmm. So that does come naturally to me. And speaking Spanish helps as well. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, I'm always, I'm always trying to perfect whatever I'm into. Uh, yeah. And uh, that's really been aimed now at, uh, at coffee. If you go to my cafes, you see art on the wall that's indigenous from uh, five different artists uh, who, uh, from the Wijadica tribe in Mexico, right? That's something I was doing before coffee, and it was really trying to exhibit 
those artists as individual artists, not as anthropological curios, right? So already then, I really was after trying to give recognition to those who really were inspired and loved what they were doing and were doing something extraordinary. Yeah. Do you, okay. um, you, have you, have you ever been served coffee that you, that you couldn't drink because it was so bad? Oh yeah. Come on. Lots of times. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's an easy one. <laughs> so what makes bad coffee? Oh my goodness. Uh, I mean, it can be, it can, it can be bad from a number of different sources, right? The coffee itself can be bad, unsalvageable. It can be, uh, a, a robusta, a bad robusta, right? It can be uh, Kopi Luwak, right? The infamous coffee that is swallowed uh, by a civet and then passed out the other end and then collected, uh, you know, and roasted and brewed. And some people think that's worth paying hundreds of dollars for a pound. And um, it generally tastes either dead or kind of <laughs> like the way you imagine it. <laughs> So for the kids watching, that's that's poop coffee. Yeah, that's the coffee that's beans you pull, you pull out of an animal's poop. That's right. So you know, and then I've I've had, uh, and then you get defective coffees. You can make a cup of uh, certain coffees from around the world, and every once in a while, very rarely, there's one bad bean that can be a stinker, and it lives up to its name fully. Single bean like that can wipe out an entire pot of coffee. Uh, you know, you can have Rio, as it's called, or Riado, or phenolic, and that tastes like somebody poured iodine into your coffee. Uh, I mean, Istanbul, that may have been my worst experience <laughs> the entire time I was there. The uh, Turkish coffee is great, but what they were serving back in those days was, in fact, what's called Rio. Uh, and it had this intense uh, um, iodine betadine iodine flavor to it that no amount of sugar or cream or anything would get rid of so, is is yeah. that the way the coffee was processed or did it have some chemicals in it or well it's funny uh okay so you go to brazil and this is still somewhat the case uh and uh, i went there in 19, 18, 1999 around that time and uh, the brazilians were telling me well the worst coffee is our Rio because it's really defective. Uh, and we have this problem in, in certain low lying areas with the coffee. Uh, and, uh, but the uh, Middle East uh, really loves to buy that coffee. So we actually sell it for a higher price than some of our better qualities. Hmm. Uh, so it's become an acquired taste, essentially. Hmm. Right now, I can't speak for Istanbul today or Turkey today. Yeah. This was 15 years ago. So when we were in El Salvador, there was uh, all of the really beautiful coffee um, at Monte Carlo. And then there were piles of defective coffee beans that they were still, um, that, you know, that, that were still yeah. in the sun. Right. Uh, that were going to be used for other things. When you say the defect, is it that kind of defects? Well, that would be closer to a stinker or really very fermented coffee. Yeah. Uh, you know, so that's like really spoiled fruit big time. Yeah. Uh, that that goes into the uh, into the flavor. Yeah. yeah, and that's not very pleasant either. I have to say. <laughs> one one of the fun surprises for me on that trip was tasting the fresh coffee cherry, which I was really surprised by. Yeah. It's left these very distinct memories. How would you describe to people that that cough that fruit that berry and what it tastes like and smells yeah. like? Yeah, well, it's very. There's very little berry, as you know. You put uh, you. You put the cherry in your mouth, and really it's two seeds with a little bit of mucilage around them. Uh, so, you know, the skin, once you get rid of the skin, you just really are sucking on those two beans that are covered with this, with this fine fruit. And the flavor is, uh, to me, a mild uh, melon, uh, like a honeydew mm -hmm. uh, flavor to it. And it's very, very pleasant when you, when you get the, the right ones. It's a so, juicy and sweet. It doesn't taste anything like coffee no, that we drink. No. Yeah, completely yeah. different. Small amount of caffeine in it. Uh, we are expecting to have pasca, as it's called, the dried fruit from specifically selected ripe cherries that are taken apart. They're not part of the processing to get coffee. 
they're literally the cherries are taken for the cherries themselves. Uh, and that cascara, which means uh, the, the dried, the dried uh, skin of the coffee, of the coffee cherry, uh, is then turned into a tea, mm. which is quite, can be delicious, absolutely mm -hmm. delicious. And different varieties produce different flavors. So yes. this, this will be coming in the next few months, I hope. Mm. Yeah. And and so um, we're we're uh, we're in an odd moment here because um, you've spent a, a lot of energy and a lot of your life pursuing the very best coffees. And and if people uh, you know could go into your cafe, they could get uh, the representation of that. And uh, you right. know, and, and when we serve people, we serve them a cup of coffee that we've been we very carefully control how the water's filtered and the temperature of the water and the amount of the water and the in the style which we brew it and the grind size and the amount of grounds. That's right. And you do the same thing, uh, but right now everybody's finding themselves stuck at home, yes. and uh, probably with less than ideal conditions. Um, so I thought we might just talk a little bit about, um, you know, uh, I think, I think it'd be fun if you walk people through how you'd make coffee at home and, yeah. um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll show people an alternate method. Um, and we could talk a little bit about, um, you know, best, best, uh, things people can do to make their coffee taste, taste as delicious as possible at home. No problem. Um, yeah. So I just brewed some coffee here. Um, uh, the way... The way I have coffee is with my wife uh, and uh, myself and sometimes uh, Jenny, who lives right above us, my, my daughter, uh, who's also, as you know, in the coffee business and a buyer of our coffee. Uh, so we use the Bonavita, which can do, oh, uh, ideally six to eight cups of coffee. If you, if you make less than that, your ratios are a little off and you don't get quite as good an extraction. Um, but it's a very simple machine, but it really brews it properly. Uh, one, it's the right temperature, right around 201 degrees Fahrenheit from the very start to the very end. Uh, it's a thermos, uh, thermal one, which is what I recommend. It's a uh, flat basket as well. Uh, and that really uh, allows for much more even extraction. Uh, where the water sort of falls like a gentle rain on top of this flat uh, bed of grounds and then falls evenly through the grounds as opposed to a cone shape, which I like less because you're getting different extractions from below versus what's above. So this gives you, especially if you're wanting floral, fine fruit notes and so on, this flat bed system, whether it's this way or the Kalita that I think you're going to show, the single the single cup, uh, will give you more floral uh, and nuanced flavor notes. If you want heavier body that's more emphatic with the roast and so on, then uh, then perhaps uh, another style will work. But anyway, I'm stirring this right now just to mix it all properly. And uh, we brewed a, uh, a kanzu, which is the, uh, the processing uh, uh, plant mill uh, that's in Rwanda that we get every year uh, and uh, yeah I should so let me try this actually uh, or so, some, do you yep. drink how often do you drink coffee at home every morning uh, every morning I as soon as I get up that's the very first thing I'm doing either Lori or I are uh, grinding and uh, and brewing the coffee so we use a, a virtuoso uh, grinder, which, uh, you know, if you can afford it, they're in the $100 range, I believe. They're really fabulous, uh, and they, you know, where you can really adjust the grind and get much more even results and a really good cup that way. Uh, a scale, so I'm weighing the, uh, the water. Uh, if I'm doing six cups, which is really only about 30 liquid fluid ounces of coffee uh, uh, then uh, then I'm weighing the water as well by grams and then the coffee as well grinding it and then brewing it um, so every morning what happens is 
I'm not doing what my, my consumers are doing, which is uh, drinking coffee that comes in these bags, right? I am literally getting every roast day, five days a week, little bags like this. Oh, so this is part of your, the drinking coffee in the morning is part of your job. Uh, yeah, it truly is. Yeah. That's exactly right. So for instance, this one says uh, on it, Kanzu light. So it's a light roast of Kanzu, right? It's the first batch roast. It was 33 pounds and it was roasted on the 16th of March, right? So, uh, so this one is what I actually brewed here uh, to taste. And uh, so each one of these bags is a different coffee, literally. So every morning I have a different coffee that I'm tasting in order to make sure that we're roasting it exactly right. Okay. So that all the flavors come out. That's a very tricky thing uh, to roast properly. And it, uh, it's a challenge because the slightest changes in the weather outside can affect the way you're roasting. Got it. Okay. And, um, uh, are you, are you a person that needs coffee to wake up? Um, or is it more of a ritual for you? It's, it's a pleasure. And that's what drives me first. Uh, no doubt the, the few times that I don't have coffee, yeah, I'm a little bit more sluggish. Um, but I don't generally get headaches the few times that I haven't had any. So, yeah. You know, I think the each, each one has a different reaction that way. Um, but, you know, if I'm traveling, for instance, uh, and I'm on an airline or somewhere in some hotel getting just the coffee they're serving, Nine times out of ten, I'm adding milk to it. Yeah. Okay. You know, I'm just not going to go through the hassle of, you know, proving how great I am by drinking black coffee when it's awful. So even even you add milk sometimes. Oh God, yes. So I totally understand why most people put milk in their coffee. Yeah. I would challenge them when they're in like what I'd call a third wave cafe, whether it be Tandem or whether it be us. Uh, or Grace Note or other places that they should always try the coffee black first, especially as it cools. Uh, because a lot of people still today are very surprised if they do that because they suddenly realize how much sweeter the coffee is than they ever had imagined it to ever be. Mm -hmm. Right? So uh, please, please, for those of you listening, if you put milk in your coffee, please try it black. Okay. <laughs> you may find one that's really mind boggling. And, and we, uh, one of the things we really want to do is bring um, uh, attention to our suppliers. And we want people to keep buying coffee from you, even if they can't buy it at Clover. And, um, and then, you know, do you want to just talk a little bit about sort of the next step in the supply chain? Are you worried about um, growers? I mean, uh, yeah. if COVID is hitting the entire world, not just the, you know, not just Boston right now. And. Are you worried about what that might mean? We're already facing historically low prices for coffee. Uh, yeah, no, very worried about it. This is the, uh, the harvest has ended in Central America for most of it, you know, and how much coffee now gets, and the price for coffee is extremely low. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, often it has been below the cost of production for many farmers. Uh, and now comes this, where suddenly there's a hiatus, a complete stoppage to the, uh, you know, to the consumption of coffee, at least the kinds of quantities that were taking place when restaurants and especially cafes were open. Yeah. And that's not happening. Uh, so we have yet to see, you know, how long this crisis lasts and, and what effect it does. But I very much fear that the lower consumption will mean that it's harder still to sell coffee. Yeah. Um, even for the highest quality sellers, that could be a problem. Uh, we still have to see. I mean, you know, restaurants, cafes, and uh, farmers were all in jeopardy with slightly different patterns. Yeah. And what do you think, I, what's the, the best version of this? I and mean, what can people at home do to have any impact on, on, what, on, on those farmers and what kind of coffee we're going to be able to buy in a year or two? Yeah, uh, I would say still, I would ask that people look for single farm coffees, um, whether it be us, Intelli, you know, uh, Tandem and so on. 
uh, rather than blends. Uh, blends are uh, follow the rules of where the whole is better than the parts. Uh, the coffees I sell and other third wave roasters sell as farms, we're selling them as farms because they're better that way than they are blended into something where they've lost their special flavor, their special notes, their nuances. Um, if you want to support a farmer, look for farms and find the farm or, uh, or a, a region that you really like and start exploring that. Um, but that way you should be then buying, it might be costing you more, but like us, we're paying a lot more for those coffees. Uh, and that's going much more directly to the farmer. They're getting 80, 90% of that price um, that we pay. So I would say that's the best thing they could do is turn their attention away from lens and towards single farms. I hope mm -hmm. I said that well, because mm -hmm. I really like that message to get through. Yeah. Uh, well, it can be, by the way, lightly roasted, more darkly roasted, like uh, our company, George Howe Coffee. Uh, for a lot of our coffees, we do a light roast and a medium roast. Mm -hmm. For those who want a slightly darker, a little bit more roast note and a heavier body in their coffee, or they want French press or espresso or whatever. Yeah. Well, um, thank you uh, for joining us. We're gonna. I'm. I'm gonna check in on the popovers. One yeah. last thing. One All right. Last thing. Iced coffee. You can now get it in cans, and this is not <laughs> cold brew. Yeah. This is genuine iced coffee that has been brewed correctly at regular good strength. You get it totally refrigerated, right? And and this is this is made with special machinery, patented. Uh, on the spot, so it's brewed at the correct, with the correct proportions, and then goes into these cans, uh, flash refrigerated immediately from hot to cold, uh, and so this is available on Elemental Beverage Company, and we have two coffees out this way, the Monte Carlos, which is from El Salvador, a kind of uh, coffee coffee flavor. So if you really want that full coffee flavor as an ice, get the Monte Carlos. Uh, which is this one, <laughs> and the Nano Chala, which is from Ethiopia and has more of the nuanced floral notes. So, uh, and you're, it's, and it's, do yeah. you want you, 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 you hinted at it a little bit, but cold, cold brew is not what you'd reach for? Oh, God, no. Uh, it's a completely generic beverage. Uh, it will take just about any coffee and turn it into just coffee, uh, a kind of sludge like coffee um, that is to me sourish not very sweet at all really and the whole talk about the, the, the idea that coffee should not have acidity i mean when you eat an apple it's got acidity that's higher than coffee uh wine is more acidic coca-cola is more acidic i mean there are a, a myriad of things that people drink without thinking twice where it's far more acidic than coffee uh and yet this, this has become the enemy of, of, of drinkers of coffee, on the contrary. Uh, a great strawberry is one that's got full acidity, but also has the sugar that balances it out and makes it wonderful. Uh, and coffee should be understood that way too. If it makes you pucker and, it's, uh, and it's, if that's a problem, it's probably because the coffee was either unripe, the beans themselves, or the coffee wasn't roasted properly. Um. Well, it's a really good note to uh, to leave on. So I'm gonna um, I'm gonna step out of this room. Thank you so much for joining us, George. It's really fantastic right. um, to hear your thoughts, and it's fun to see your kitchen. I think um, I'm probably not the only one who enjoys seeing you know how, how you uh, drink coffee each day. Um, well, thank you so much. See your health there. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>this and then you're going to bring this one so all right okay. and then we get rid of the george howell overlay boop okay all right uh i think we're back uh, i'm gonna check on the popovers because i think they're getting close to being done uh so there they are these popovers didn't pop that well um that's probably uh something that that we did wrong um they're not terrible but they didn't pop as well as i would like so we'll take a look at those in a few more minutes um 
I'm going to make a little bit of coffee and then uh, talk about that with you guys. So at home, I don't make coffee that often. Um, I, I'll drink coffee at Clover most days. If I am making coffee, I'd like to make it in this because I like to have a little bit at a time. And, um, and I'll usually make this a single cup at a time. So it's a little bit different than the method that uh, George showed you. Um, what I'll do is I'll have my water pot and I will add some water here. Uh, mostly what this is doing, uh, it's not really rinsing the filter that much, it is a little bit, but if I really wanted to get all the papery taste out of the filter, I'd have to rinse it over and over and over again. Mostly what's happening right now is it's preheating this whole system, so it's getting this cone hot. It's actually so hot it hurts my fingers a little bit. And it's getting um, the glass in here hot. And, and this is a double walled glass, which works really nice for keeping that drink hot for me for a little while. And then I'm going to grab some ground coffee. Um, and, and then I go ahead and put the coffee in. And this is very similar to what we do at Clover. I will pour a little bit of coffee in the middle. I'm trying to get a couple tablespoons of coffee in there. And I'm going to let that, uh, this is called blooming. Um, I'm just going to let that go for probably about 20 seconds. You see the bubbles coming up, that's some carbon dioxide coming out of the coffee. And, uh, and then after about 20 seconds, I'm going to pour more water. I'm not going to worry about these dry spots. Um, they're not going to hurt anything. But it's uh, mostly what's happening is about maybe 80, 90% of these grounds are going to be pre-soaked. So when I add more water, um, it's going to uh, really quickly um, surround the, the ground and start extracting the coffee. Um, and so this whole process is going to take about two and a half minutes. Um, I will, uh, I'll go ahead and I'll let this come down and I'll pour it up again. Uh, this is like a modified version of what we do at Clover. I tend to pour a little bit more here at home so I have a little bit more grounds. Um, rough rule of thumb is that if you want to weigh how much water you have versus how much coffee you have, um, you're probably, w the method we use, we end up around 15 or 16 times as much final beverage as the weight of the coffee itself. So if you're starting out, you know, with 22 grams of coffee, you may end up with um, uh, 15 or 16 times that much weight in the final cup. Uh, so for Clover, uh, 22, 23, 24 grams of coffee to about a 10 and a half ounce final cup, which is uh, a little bit bigger than a measuring cup. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and add some more water and let that come through. And while that's happening, I'll show you, I'll show you where this came from and I'll talk a little bit about grinders if you want to come around the corner here. Um, I have a bunch of coffee and these are actually perspiring because they just came out of the freezer. I forgot to ask George about that when he's on the phone, but he turned me on to freezing coffee. It's a great way to keep the flavor. Um, you can see I've got a really big bag of Bonnie Carlo, especially if you're rocking something like this, a five pound bag keep it in the freezer, uh, otherwise you're probably going to lose a lot of the delicious flavor from the coffee. I have a grinder, this is actually what we use at Clover, so this is a commercial grinder. Um, it has a scale right here, so it's pretty cool, you hit the button and it grinds until it hits a certain weight and then it stops. Um, this type of grinder is uh, similar to what George was showing you. Um, this is a burr grinder and it gets really, really even coffee grind. Let's grind a little bit of that and I'll show you. And then if we want to go over here, I'm going to show you a different style grinder that some of you may have at home. So let's just stop. All right, so I should have opened up my big bag of George Howell, but I haven't opened it yet and I'm keeping it closed. So instead I'm going to a tandem. I hope that doesn't uh, create any offense for George when he watches this later. But um, these are all really beautiful copies and um, and so I would put beans in here, and I'm sure a lot of you have used this. This has a blade in there, so instead of grinding the coffee between um, plates, it's grinding the coffee with a blade, and I'm not great at these. Um, but what, when I say not great, I mean I'm trying to get to um, a consistent size of grind, and no, nobody's really great at the blade grinders because it's pretty hard to control them. Um, So I'm going to take a look at that and I'm going to go a little bit further. 
Okay. And then, Clem, I left a piece of paper over there by the grinder. So just a white piece of paper. Can you grab that? So, if you're grinding at home, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna show you. So, this is about what you're aiming at. So this is what I'm trying to get to in terms of grind size. So if you can see that, you can probably even get a little bit closer in. So this is the size of the grind I'm trying, I'm aiming for. And uh, it's pretty consistent. That's just because that those didding grinder blades do a really good job. Over here, we have um, much more, see there's like larger ones and there's smaller ones here. So there's more variation in size, but it's not bad. And in general, this is all about what I wanna be brewing my coffee at. So now we'll come back over to my coffee. Um, this is, I'll just put a little bit more in there and I'm gonna come out about where I want it to be. Um, and uh, we'll pull these popovers out of the oven. And, um, and I'm just gonna talk a little bit more about coffee and coffee brewing um, while we let those popovers cool. Uh, so we'll post that recipe a little bit later. But um, uh, just for those of you who really love coffee, just talking a little bit about how it works uh, might be helpful. So you probably all remember um, there are molecules, you know, and, and organic uh, molecule carbon is, is, is pretty common in, in organic compounds. And then there are, um, uh, then there are, um, there are uh, molecules where we combine, um, we combine different, um, different uh, atoms to make a compound. Uh, and one of those is caffeine. And so if you're just thinking back, for those of you who like haven't done um, chemistry for a long time, in organic chemistry, you end up with these long carbon chains and then they're configured in different ways and they have different properties. And so some of them are aromatic. So we have like volatile um, or aromatic compounds. Um, in coffee, we have fats in coffee. So there's oils that can be in coffee beans. Uh, there's, there's a class um, called tannins, and there's also acids. Um, there's other things too. In a coffee bean, there might be more than 1,000 different compounds, uh, which is wild in that one little bean. And when we grind up the coffee, we're um, making the parts of the bean more accessible to the water. And so I think this coffee is done brewing. I'm gonna just grab that. So this is, this is what, uh, this is my, this is my home routine, but you could modify it slightly and we'll share that recipe. And, uh, and the way I like to drink coffee in the morning, I, I usually never drink it in the afternoon, obviously, but the way I usually drink in the morning is I'll have a relatively small cup and I'll pour myself a little bit at a time. Uh, and then I'll let it cool a little bit and then I'll pour a little bit more later. And that's, that's how I tend to like to take coffee. Um, so when we're, when we're making coffee, we grind up those beans to help create more surface area so that the water, the hot water, can contact the beans. And one of the reasons George doesn't like cold brew is at lower temperatures, um, different compounds come out of the coffee than at higher temperatures. And so it, it is like a more narrow, um, chemically, you're pulling a more narrow view from that bean than when you have hot water, which um, it works as a, a solvent to pull out a lot of other compounds that wouldn't come out otherwise. Um, and so when you're brewing coffee, you guys can bear with me a little bit. I'm gonna make a little graph, a little chart. This axis down here is gonna be time. So this is gonna be when you just first poured the water on and then, uh, and then this say this is two minutes later and say this is four minutes later. And then what's gonna happen is these different families of compounds are gonna come out of the coffee in different proportions at different times. So say for example, that at one, uh, uh, in one set of conditions, your, your acids may come out like this. So most of them are out at this moment and then less and less are coming in as time goes on. And maybe your tannins are coming out like this. 
um, and maybe your fats are coming out like this. Um, and so these different families of compounds are coming out of the coffee at different moments in time. And you can shift these relative peaks based on the, um, the grind size and the temperature of the water, the ratio of water to ground. So those different things will shift these peaks. And what you end up doing is if, if this is the moment when I pull it, so if I only go to two minutes and I have these conditions, then all these compounds you see are what end up making up my cup. So these are the relative flavors in my cup and I don't get those. And so when you talk about under extracted coffee, that means you may have cut it off at an earlier point and you didn't get some of the flavors you wanted. And over extracted coffees, you may have gone past the point you wanted to and you're getting more bitter flavors or, or um, maybe different kinds of um, acids that you don't want in your coffee. So that's what we're controlling for. And what I just suggest at home, play around. I'm, you see that um, I think it, it probably it should look pretty straightforward what I do at home, what George does at home. Uh, but mostly we've, we've probably tuned it to what we have at home and played with it a while. So I just encourage people, if you haven't made coffee before at home, just play around with some different things. Uh, there's some pretty inexpensive ways to get started. And Clementine, you think we should break into one of those popovers and yes. take a peek? Yes. All right. Go ahead and, and grab one carefully. So we would normally let these cool a little bit. Uh, these are the, the ones that came out in the muffin tins and, uh, and those are still, still cooling. And so it's a little bit more of a muffin shape. And these are the ones that came out of a popover tin. And I'm a little disappointed with the pop. These, these ones I say didn't pop very well. And I'm probably gonna blame myself for that because I think I screwed up the, um, process by not adding the milk in with the eggs. And that's probably what we faced. But if we open these up, they're gonna be really yummy. And what you wanna find inside of the popover is this eggy network. Um, looks like this. And so part of what we wanna do this cooking show is to encourage people just to try things in their own kitchens. And even most mistakes, I'm not, from, from a professional standpoint, I'm not very happy with these poppers. I'm not even sure we would sell these at Clover. but. I'm guessing they're gonna taste pretty good sometime. What do you think? They're really good. Take a little bite. Yeah, so when, even when you make mistakes in the kitchen, they can come out really delicious. Mm. You see, I added a little bit of butter. Um, butter's really yummy on popovers. Jam's really good with popovers. And of course, they're really yummy with tea or coffee. Um, thanks for joining everybody. Um, we'll be back tomorrow. I'll try to make it start at three o'clock tomorrow. Um, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll try to learn a little something on the tech every day. And a big thanks to George Howell for joining us. It's really wonderful to have him on. We're gonna have some other guests coming on later this week. So hope to see everybody soon.